Hello, my name is Barry Lacey. I'm an archaeologist and a historian, and I'm going to be taking you on a journey through the War of Independence and County Wexford in the year 1920. And first, we're going to start where it all began at the 1916 Rising in Inniscorty at Diathnean. I'm standing here at the top of Castle Hill in Inniscorty, and the building you can see over my right shoulder is Diathnean. Now, this was the headquarters for the Irish Volunteers during the 1916 Rising, when Inniscorty was occupied for several days. It was one of only several places outside of Dublin which rose up, but it was also the last garrison to surrender. Now, after the rising ended, many of its leaders and people who were active in it were taken up, gathered, imprisoned, and sent over to Fraunkoff internment camp over in Wales. They stayed there for several months imprisoned when they were eventually released, and they came home to Wexford as heroes. Now, they reorganised under the Sinn Féin banner, and they stood in the general election in 1918 and Sinn Féin won a landslide majority. And rather than go over to Westminster in London, they decided to set up their own independent Irish Parliament here. And on the 21st of January 1919, they sat for the first time in the Mansion House in Dublin. Now also on the same day in Tipperary, we had the first military action of the War of Independence. This was in the Sullahead Beg ambush, in which a group of Irish volunteers ambushed and shot two RIC officers. And this was the beginning of a long struggle, both politically and militarily, that would last th through 1919, 1920 and into 1921 till the truce. And it was one that Wexford was very much part of. During the War of Independence, the IRA undertook various different um, intelligence gathering operations. This allowed them to to know the strength of their enemy and their activities and where they were going to be. But as well as looking to combat the physical forces of the British, the soldiers and the RIC, they also went at their intelligence operations and they tried to make the country as ungovernable as for the British as they could. And in April 1920, a spate of attacks and raids took place on customs and excise offices in County Wexford, in Gorey, New Ross, Wexford Town, and also here in Inniscorty, where at the moment we're standing on Rafter Street, which was previously Court Street back in 1920. And this building here to the left of me is just across from the courthouse. And on the 20th of April, a man by the name of J.C. McCluskey left the building heading back up towards George Street um, to go home when he was approached by two men looking for uh, a light for a cigarette and when he was reaching into his jacket pocket to get the cigarette they pulled a revolver on him. They, uh, they escorted him back to the premises and when they gained entry inside they proceeded to burn all of the tax documents and they later fled and went back up towards George Street. But it's just an example of how they tried to dis cause disruption to the British, British system as well as to their forces. So we're here in the village of Clonroach, which is between Inniscorthy and New Ross. And this is the scene of one of the first major attacks by the IRA during the War of Independence. On the night of the 24th of April 1920, the RIC barracks, which has since been, been demolished and was on the site of the new guard station, which you can see behind me here, was attacked by the IRA. It was occupied by about several, um, several RIC at the time, and they opened the attack by, with gunfire from shotguns and rifles from the front here and also to the back. Now the site has changed much today, this road is a lot smaller and there was a wall coming up along here and it was in a very rural location whereas part of this part of the village has been built up now since it was really on the outskirts of the town back in the early 1920s. And the, the, the fighting lasted for about um, for between two to three hours and the IRA attempted to throw bombs which they were which they manufactured themselves were known as tail bombs. They got this name because they had a tail coming out of them similar to a kite. This was to help with your aim. And these were supposed to land on top of the barrack roof where they would create a hole and then they would be able to pour um, more of their explosives inside. Um, there was a lot of preparation for the attack. They trenched the roads around them, set up guards outposts and also they cut a lot of the telegraph wires surrounding as well so that the RIC couldn't um, couldn't call for help. There was also a landmine which was set meant to be set against the building that would explode um, but, but fortunately fortunate for the people inside 
the person delivering this failed to show up or by the time he showed up the attack was over and after about three hours they had to call off the attack um, due to the failure of the bombs to explode and they had to disperse and they reckon there was about 300 people involved in this uh, attack either directly or indirectly between people here firing at the barracks and people setting up various outposts throughout the area and it was insignificant because it was the first major attack on a barracks in County Wexford at the time and it had a lasting effect because the county had been relatively quiet up until this period. Following on towards the end of 1920, you talk around the autumn period, there had been a lot of activity by the IRA in Wexford. We had the attack on Clonroach Barracks, we had multiple RIC barracks that were vacated, burned throughout the county, and also multiple ambushes um, and assassin the assassination attempt on Lee Wilson. So towards the end of 1920, things were getting a, a lot heated in Wexford, and it was decided around in October to try and form a flying column. And this was done after multiple meetings here in the hall behind me in Ballandagan in North County Wexford. Now, what is a flying column? This was consisted of between a minimum of about 10 men they started off with. And it was all men from the local North Wexford area. And initially the county was organized as a single unit, but then a division was created between North and South, where we had the North Wexford Brigade and the South Wexford Brigade. So it was a reorganization of the IRA during this period and this coincided with the forming of the column and as a majority of the men f in, were already from North Wexford it was decided that it would be the North Wexford flying column it consisted of about 10 to 10 men 30 at strongest and most of these were people from the local area who were already on the run so they kept busy they were constantly on the move going from safe houses to safe houses all throughout North Wexford and they were also known by the IRA as the active service units because of the reason that they were always very active. Two of the men responsible for setting up the North Wexford Flying Column were from the local area in Ballandagan here themselves. This were Philip and Thomas Doyle who were from the place known as the Piers. They were known as Doyle's of the Piers, not too far out, out, out the road here. And I said the Flying Column were very active. They were formed in November 1920 and they consisted of men who were on the run and the idea that they were always active, always keeping the enemy on their feet. Now as well as relying on the help of their own men within the column, and the various different companies throughout North Wexford and indeed South Wexford. They also relied heavily on the hospitality of the local people. There were multiple safe houses set up all around the area and it's important to realise that while the column or the people in the safe houses at the time, if a raid took place from the Tans or the RIC, they could hop a ditch and escape to the, to the next location. The people in the, ta in the house had to stay and they often had to suffer the rampage of the raids and the routing through the drawers and upstairs and the abuse that came along with these raids. And the particular reference that says that without the hospitality and the help of the local people in, in the various different areas in Wexford, the IRA column wouldn't have been able to, to operate. There was a man who lived just down the road here and behind the school um, known as Seamus Rafter. He was a very in influential individual, not just in the area, but in Wexford in particular during the 1916 Rising. He was one of the key um, leaders in the rebellion and there's a statue of him, anyone can see it, in an escort just over the new bridge. And unfortunately he was didn't live to see the formation of the column as he was involved in bomb making activity in a score in an escort where unfortunately after an accident um, he, he died several days later and he's buried not too far just across the way here in the cemetery at the back of the church so we're standing here now on Ballycarney bridge over the river slaney and going back and talking about the safe houses and the network of them that the IRA had in County Wexford. One of these was located in the, behind the cottage in the woodlands there. And this was the home of Pat Kenny and his family. Pat was the officer commanding of the North Wexford Brigade Flying Column. And his house would have been raided multiple times during the period. And this was part of operations by the British. Because they didn't just go after the men, they went after their homes and their families. It was all part of intelligence that they gathered on, who they lived with, who they kept company with. Now the IRA had to counteract this with their own intelligence gathering, and this helped them in various different aspects of the War of Independence. One way was the gathering of resources. In 1919, they held up a 
consignment of an explosive called Jenny Light that was bound for Ryland Quarry in Bunclody, not too far here from Ballycarney. And that was taken and later used to make explosives, which was used in the attack in the barracks in Clonroach. And also, not too far from here, there was a man by the name of Doyle, who in October of 1920 was taken by the IRA and executed for informing on, on them to the British. And this is just an example of the wide variety of intelligence gathering that the IRA had undertaken because they had to understand their enemy as well as their enemy understood them and this provided with the information on their strength on their activities which allowed them to operate in various different abilities throughout the county. We're standing here at the crossroads in the village of Kalan and the building you can see behind me here was once the local RIC police station. Now this was built around the mid 1800s and in the early 1900s there was many buildings like this located all throughout County Wexford and a lot of them were in rural settings maybe on crossroads where you might have only had a pub, a shop and a church or in some cases all you had was the barracks itself. These would be manned by maybe two or three local um, RIC police officers and it would have been mostly community policing. Now at the start of the 1900s there was many of these located throughout County Wexford and at the start of the War of Independence, due to the increase in the IRA activities, a lot of them were vacated. They were more prone to and open to attack because they were in rural, isolated areas. So they were open targets essentially for the IRA. And the men were taken out of them and sent to barracks in more urban areas where they could consolidate the forces together, make them more stronger, such as the men here were probably moved in Escorty or New Ross, for example. And these left a lot of these buildings um, vacated. And the General Headquarters IRA up in Dublin gave orders for any of these barracks that were emptied to be um, sabotaged. So, for example, here on the 12th of May 1920, the local IRA burned the empty police barracks here in Killan. And when it was visited the next morning by the local constable, he said that it was a complete wreck. There was hardly anything left. Now, a lot of these happened in around from spring onwards in 1920 in County Wexford. And there was a total of 24 in that year that were either sabotaged or burned. And this gave the IRA then the opportunity, the upper hand rather, because it meant that the British had lost their capabilities to station men in many of these rural areas. And this meant that it was good for the IRA because it left there many of the areas open to them. And also you had the arrival of the Black and Tans in, and the auxiliary forces to supplement the RIC in spring 1920. So although a lot of these were vacated, the IRA were afraid that they would be occupied by the Black and Tans. So essentially when all these barracks were burned or sabotaged, they meant that the IRA had a lot more free, free roam around the areas. And every local community has a link to that period through these barracks. And a lot of them were later rebuilt. The one here in Killan was later rebuilt by a local man where his family lived in it and then it was taken over as a police by the Gardaí and it was a guard station until the 1970s. Um, many others of them were left in ruin. For example, Feather, if you're going along the main street you can see the ruins of the one there and others we have no trace of them left at all, such as Tintern Abbey for example. Um, but we have a photograph from that. There was a lot of cases then where although the police might have left, the local sergeant's family would have remained inside of it. So there's two examples of that. One was from ba Bally Brazil and the other was from Tintern, where the local IRA men came to burn the barracks, but they were very courteous and the papers are very, very, um, very good at reporting this, that they were courteous to the women and children of the police. And even in the case of Bally Brazil, they took the furniture out of the house before they set a fire. And it also said that they took the local the chickens out of the hen house and brought them to a safe location. So although they were, they were out with a mission, they were conscious that these were local people. And a lot of the local sergeants were in these areas for many years. So they might have gained the respect of the local people and mingled with the local community. One of the major undertakings of the IRA in mid-1920 was the assassination of the RIC District Inspector Lee Wilson in Gorey. And we're going to go over to Owen Dunbar now, a native of that town, to tell us a bit more about that event. 
Percival Lee Wilson was born in Kensington in London in 1887. Uh, he joined the RIC and was sent to Galway and originally and then to Cork. In Cork in 1914 he met and married uh, Mary Ryan and uh, in 1914 and at the outbreak of the war he joined the Irish the Royal Irish Regiment. He was sent to the Western Front where he got injured, badly injured, um, came back to Ireland to sort of recuperate. Uh, he was stationed in Dublin in 1916 and was there for the Ryzen. After the surrender, of, when Pierce surrendered to General Law, all the volunteers were marched to the Rotunda Green where they surrendered up their arms. Wilson had a big part to play in this. He made them lie on the ground overnight for up to 12 hours without any use of a toilet or anything like that. But what he's most notable for was picking out Tom Clark. Tom Clark was one of the leaders and the signatory to the, to the proclamation. Ta Clark, he, he brought Clark to the steps of the rotunda, facing the female nursing quarters and stripped them naked. He also assaulted them and left them there overnight. Michael Collins and Liam Tobin had witnessed this and was stored in their memory and from the time that they were in Frongok, the word was that they would eventually get Lee Wilson. And that was in 1916. So we come forward then to 1920. Wilson at this stage was an RIC district inspector stationed here in Gorey. Well, on the avenue, his house was just behind us here at Millmount. At, at nine o'clock on the morning of the 15th of June, he left his house to make his way to the RIC station up where the Gorey Garda station is now. He'd done whatever bits he had to do and Sergeant O'Donnell of the RIC accompanied him as far as the railway station. They then proceeded to the railway bridge here on the Ballycanew Road where O'Donnell waved goodbye to him. Wilson would have kept walking, probably reading his morning paper. When he got to where I am, about to where I am now, there was a car stopped with the hood up, apparently broken down. Wilson, I think, paid no heed to this and walked on by. When he had got slightly beyond the car, a shot rang out from Sean Whelan that struck him in the shoulder. Several more shots rang out then and Wilson, even though badly wounded, was able to run and struggle to get within maybe 20 yards of his house, which is just below us here where the pier is. That's Millmount House, the home to Percival Lee Wilson at the time. The gang ran after him and shot him again. The final coup de grace, I'm told, was that he was shot in the back of the head and one of the members stooped, picked up his paper, hopped into the getaway car, which sped off down the Ballycanew Road and used every back road to eventually make its way up to Ballycarney and Ballandagan, where the trail went cold on the car. One of the last major events of the War of Independence in the year 1920 by the IRA was the shooting of local RIC constable William Jones. He was stationed in Bunclody, then called Newtown Barry at the time. And the circumstances surrounding the event are just a couple of question marks hanging over the head of it. For example, how many people were involved in it, who exactly pulled the trigger. But we're going to listen to the story of it now from a local man by the name of Dinley Hallinan, who would have heard it growing up near the town. An RIC officer was in the barracks here behind me, and uh, he was in the corner there, in what is the anglers there now, and uh, he was getting a drink, and he was shot there. Shot, coming up to Christmas, 21st or 22nd of December. He was from Limerick, Jones was his name. He was a married man with three or four kids. He was from Limerick brought back to Limerick, buried in Limerick. One of the more tragic incidents in the War of Independence in County Wexford was the innocent um, killing of James Dunn. He was a miller follower from Ballinatray who worked in Ferns and he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and he was shot dead by a local RIC constable 
just outside of Dunbar's pub. And we're going to go now to the owner, the present day owner of that pub, Tom Dunbar, to tell us a little bit about that story. There's a man, a man, a miller, a man called uh, Jim Dunn. He was in Ballina Tray down in Courtown. Uh, and like I say, he was a miller over in Bulgers. And he came in here for a drink. And there was two RIC officers here who were the worst of wear. They were drunk. And uh, they asked him to have a drink with him and he wouldn't have a drink. And they took umbrage at that. And they, ha they were armed, both of them were armed. There was one fellow was the name of Lenehan, he was a corkman, and the other fellow was Connell. And Lenehan um, took out his revolver and shot, shot at him, or there was, I remember my father, that years ago there was a couple of sh um, bullet holes in the roof here, which used to be quite visible at one stage, you know, going back. I'm not sure whether actually he hit Mr. Dunn here or not, I'm not 100% certain, but I know that uh, I was told, my father often told me that he got went out the door, followed by the Lenehan, and he shot him, and he could mortally wound him possibly under our window here, under the front window. And Mr. Dunn went across the road, right as the, at the old entrance into Bulger's Yard where he worked, and that's where he died. In the meantime, I think the other man with him, Connell, took a couple of wild shots, I think, and hit. Uh, the, the word was that he hit the pier over there and people often told me there was uh, bullet holes in the pier now but that's, that's what I often heard. Um, Lenehan then was spirited away I think pretty quickly both of them and uh, he there was an the inquest I think it was an inquiry an inquest and it, 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 I think it said that he, he was guilty of murder but when I went to court, he, it was dropped down to manslaughter and he only received seven years. It seemed to be very mild punishment, especially in those times. Maybe today it might be slightly different, but in those times, seven years are very mild. And uh, the fellow says he got away with murder, I suppose, you know. Towards the end of 1920 in County Wexford, the War of Independence had um, seen a drastic increase in activity by the IRA and this eventually culminated in the introduction of martial law into the county in early 1921. Now this gave the military authorities a lot more um, powers within the county and it suspended a lot of the liberties which people would have lived under then. Social gatherings were outlawed. Um, People weren't allowed to loiter. Um, the sending of unofficial tele telegrams was barred. And a major one was that anyone found wearing police uniform, collaborating with the IRA, housing members of the IRA, or having a weapon in their possession would have been prone to being court-martialed by the military in a military court and could possibly have the sentence of death um, placed upon their head. So this was a major deterrent at the time and it was a major increase um, on the people in County Wexford. And we're living in times now when we're, we're in lockdown due to the current pandemic. But it's interesting when you know it 100 years on, people that lived in the county were under somewhat similar um, restrictions, but for entirely separate circumstances. And here we are talking about 100 years on to this day.